I can't hear you. What is that name? Jesus. What a great day, a resurrection day, a celebration day. We should enjoy every bit of it. This is the day that we celebrate to change history forever. God sent his son who became a man, who lived a sinless life, who gave his life on the cross, who rose from the dead, sits at the right hand of the Father today, and offers mercy and salvation and grace to each and every one of us. Praise the Lord for that. You know, we've been last several weeks talking uh, about ministry and matters of ministry in our life and how important our life is to the will of God and to the things of God. And then we did our communion service last Sunday and celebrated uh, our crucifixion of the Savior who sacrificed, was accepted by our Heavenly Father. But I want to just move back into 1 Peter. We, in all those seven weeks we did out of 1 Peter, I never covered this first part. So we're going to go into 1 Peter this morning, and we're going to talk about hope. We're living in a culture and a society that just un doesn't understand a whole lot about hope. So we're going to talk about the resurrected life that hope brings to us and the hope that God gives us in Christ Jesus. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. We have it on the screen. But if you do want to follow along in your own Bible, it's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is un imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. You know, if you start looking at this verse, you start seeing that all of a sudden here's the power of God starting to be manifest. It's manifest through our faith for salvation ready to be ready, revealed the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though it is tested by fire, may be found in the result of the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him, now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. This is such a tremendous passage filled with just glory and praise and blessing. It's like Peter just has just taken off the grill for us today, this 12-ounce steak, all right? Like nothing you've ever eaten before. There's no way you can look at this and put the whole thing in your mouth at one time. It's just too much. It's too rich, it's too flavorful. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to cut it up into little bite-sized pieces for you. Amen? We'll slice it up nice and chewable size. And then it's your responsibility after I slice it to chew it. So I'm hoping that you will ingest and chew and receive the Word of God today as, it's, as it is presented to you. This, really these verses, six verses, three through nine, is a one long complex sentence in the Greek language but it is filled with praise and intensity and it just bubbles over with power and it definitely is certainly an intense passage of scripture. And it talks about at the core of this that hope is available. I don't know about you, but we're living in a world which sees so little hope. But for the human spirit and for the human soul, hope is a necessary commodity for just living a full and complete life. The trouble is this. People look in all the wrong places for hope. And they ultimately get their hopes dashed upon the rocks of some circumstances. And they are depressed and in despair. But just because that has happened perhaps in your life on occasion, more than once most likely, it does not mean that there's no hope available. And that hope that is available is available to every person who looks in the right direction. So this sermon this morning is about looking in the right direction to find what is, I believe, the most sure, confident hope in the world. Listen to the apostle. Let me just read one of those verses back to you. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. A living hope. It's a giving hope. It's a hope that is steadfast. It's a hope that is sure. It's a hope that's grounded in a relationship, and that relationship is with God himself. 
So let's kind of break this into pieces and see what we come up with. First of all, we'll see that this hope it's talking about is a hope that transforms your life. In fact, it comes from God himself. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is according to his great mercy has caused us to experience this new life, to experience this hope. In other words, the hope we're talking about today doesn't come from the culture around you. As I mentioned earlier, people look in all the wrong places for hope. Now, we put hope in people. We put hope in ourselves. We put hope in our spouses. We put hope in our jobs. We put hope in our future. We put hope in doctors. But every one of these things can fail us, and we end up discouraged and almost to the point of hopelessness. It doesn't take long to see when the big Powerball lotteries are coming out to see many, many people who are looking for hope in all the wrong direction, paying what we call the poor man's tax. There's no hope there. People are always looking for something to come in, for their ship to come in, so to say. I figured, you know, with the way things go for me, when my ship comes in, I'll probably be at the airport. You, know? <laughs> you don't have to be. It depends where you're looking for hope. And he's saying here that we have a hope that's rooted and comes from God himself. And here, understand this, God himself can never fail. His word is true. So this hope comes from God, and it comes out of his abundant mercy. He says, who according to his mercy has begotten us to a living hope. Now catch what he's talking about here. You have to understand your position before God in your life. The Bible tells us without God in our life, before we come to Christ in our life, that we are all sinners. There, there's no hope in that, all right? That, that there's this fear of death that people with, the uncertainty of the future, the uncertainty about things. God does a work in our life. You know, you have to understand this. God is a merciful God. He could have rightfully cast us off forever. Why? Because he is a just God. He's a righteous God. Sins and offense to God. But look at God, what he does. In his mercy... He sends Jesus Christ into the world to become a human being like us. And this Jesus who becomes like us out of God's mercy chooses to live a sinless life unlike us to give that sinless life on the altar of the cross as a sacrifice, as the payment for our offenses because the wages of sin is death. Jesus dies for us. Why does he do this? So that we who have offended God we who are guilty before God, so that we can be forgiven by the very one that we've offended. That's the grace of God. Now, what does he say here? He says, it is according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again. According to his great mercy. It doesn't say out of his great mercy. You could say that, but, it, you know, this is very definitive language from the Greek. And it says it's according to. You say, what's the difference between out of and according to? Well, if I'm a billionaire and I give you $10 today, I gave you out of my wealth, out of my abundance. If I'm a billionaire and after church I decide to give you a million dollars, you'd like that better, right? Then that would be according to my wealth. One has to do with just a portion. The other has to do with proportion. God who is much gave much. God who has much offered much. That's what it talks about. The portion versus the proportion. But what happens is this hope is presented to, to you and to me. God does something in our heart and life if we choose to respond. This hope, he says here, it brings about a new birth or a second birth. His great, great hope has caused us to, his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Why do we need to be born again? Because by our first birth, as I've said already, we're sinners. We stand in defense to God. By our first birth, we're rebels. By our first birth, we can't please God no matter how hard we try. But listen, to this, what's the verse say? He calls us to be born. God does a work in you. When you come to Christ, you're made a new Christian. By your new birth, you're introduced to a whole new family. By your new birth, you become a child of God. By your new birth, you became a daughter of the King. By your new birth, you became a son of one of the living children of God. By your new birth, you can please God. By your new birth, you can live for Christ. By your new birth, you become a friend of God. Yeah. Praise, that's the, that's the grace of God. So let me ask you this question. 
first would be back to this, back to that first birth. <clears throat> How do you know that you were born? I mean, people think, well, that, that's, that's maybe not as easy to answer as you might think. Uh, I, well, I'm here, so I must be born. I mean, how else could I be here today if I, if I hadn't been born, right? But let's, let's, let me ask you a little bit different. People say, well, if I, I can prove I'm born because I have a birth certificate. And my birth certificate proves I was born. Been a lot of news about that, by the way. Those can be faked, Right? Anybody can fake a birth certificate. People do it all the time to get illegal passports and everything else. You can fake a birth certificate. But Brother Joe, I have a picture just as cute as it can be of me when I was a baby. I'm just laying naked on a blanket and I, you know. Let me ask you this question. Can you prove that's you? It doesn't look like you. Please leave your clothes on for, 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 for examination, but I, I don't think that, I, I mean, that can, you can, I don't know it's really you. Uh, listen, I have a paper with, with my baby footprint on it. All right? Whip off your socks and shoes there and let's compare it. Now, I can't think there's any evidence there. It might be cute, but your foot's a lot bigger now. How do I know that's your footprint? Well, you know, I have an affidavit that was signed by seven people at my birth who witnessed my birth. Well, that's per- impressive. But how do I know all those seven people aren't a bunch of liars you paid off to say that? I I mean, really. Once you discount the outward evidence that you've been born the first time, there's only one answer, and it's this. Pastor, I'm alive, and my life proves that I have been born. That's an unanswerable agreement. Amen? But let me ask you the second question. How do you know you've been born again? I believe the same principle applies. You can present a lot of documents. and You can, you can bring forth various proofs. You, you may have a baptism certificate that was signed by a pastor. You may walk the aisle. You may say, well, I, I was in church, and the pastor asked me if you want to be saved, raise my hand. So I raised my hand. You know, and I did join the church, and, and so on and so on. But the outward signs, those outward signs, they're really just useless. Because you can do all those things, would you not agree? You can do all those things and still not be a genuine believer in Christ Jesus. You say, well, then what's the answer? The only real answer is this. is one I just mentioned. I know I'm born again because I have the life of Christ. I have the life of God in my soul. I was birthed. I was made new. The Bible says if any man's in Christ, we, we're a new creature. See, a lot of people get this thing about Christianity mixed in with all the religions of the world. They don't they're not able to distinguish nor differentiate what's going on here. All those elements of religion have one thing in common, except Christianity. It is man attempting by his own measure, standards, works, or efforts to reach God on some level. He has an understanding that God is high and holy and elevated, and he's not. And so he begins by the by effort and meticulous exercise to follow certain disciplines and codes of behavior, whatever it might be. But God and Christianity are, are complete. God now comes down to man. And God now offers himself and his mercy to man. God makes himself available to man. And once man opens his heart, there is a supernatural spiritual activity that takes place whereby you experience a new birth. You say, what? Well, explain that. I can't. I just, it's miraculous. It's miraculous. God does a birthing process in your heart, and it brings about a hope. And the Bible tells us going about this hope that it's made sure by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Blessed be God, who's begotten us unto a living hope. How? To the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now catch this. this, Don't miss this part. A lot of people say, you know, I'm just saved because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But if all Jesus did was to be crucified without any resurrection, then there's really no way, according to the Bible, that we can experience salvation. You say, well, that's just shocking. You mean we're not saved by the death of Jesus Christ? We're saved by and through the blood and the death of Jesus Christ. It only becomes valid by one thing, and that one thing that has to happen is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Other words, Jesus is some dead martyr. You say, well, why the resurrection? The resurrection was to prove that God approved of the sacrifice for our sins. The resurrection was to demonstrate the power of God. 
the resurrection proves that our sins really have been forgiven by the cross and the blood of Jesus. The resurrection proves that God has the power, the ability to give me a brand new life. We too are raised from death. In our life, we have now life and a victory that's not like it used to be. And what he's saying here, it's a living hope. And it's able to keep us forever. He's able to take us to heaven when we die. He's able to give us his grace and glory for all eternity. It's a certain and a sure hope is exactly what he's telling us. Listen to me. The one thing we do know, beyond anything else, beside any shadow of a doubt, what Peter's saying here is we are safe in Jesus Christ. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what's going to come up on the horizon tomorrow, but we don't know if we're going to live a long life. We don't know if we're going to face sickness. And we don't know if our health's going to hold. We don't know if our money's going to be sufficient. We don't know if our job is secure. We don't know if our retirement will last. But one thing I do know is that my hope is secure in Christ Jesus, and he will never fail me. Author Warren Wisby, theologian Wisby, said this, a living hope, catch this, a living hope is one that has life in it. Therefore, it can give life to us. Because it has life, it grows and becomes greater and more beautiful as time goes on. Time destroys most hopes. They fade and then die. But the passing of time only makes a Christian's hope that much more glorious. That's a living hope. That's the power of God. So it's this hope that transforms, but it's also a hope that ensures my inheritance. He says, we have been brought into this hope to an inheritance and incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Now, inheritance is obviously something that, you know, we haven't earned. We we receive through the the death of, of somebody that's died, a loved one or a friend. We'll have an inheritance. Hopefully that, that, you know, that, that's given to us at that time. Receiving inheritance, though, does require a death. Jesus submitted to the Father and died our death, but along with that resurrection comes an inheritance for us. In fact, this inheritance, it is assured and it is guaranteed. In fact, it is inheritance, it says in this passage, that does not fade. An inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away, reserved in heaven for you. The New International Version says it can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's an inheritance, in other words, that is secure. It's an inheritance that won't rot and decay and be defiled. It's incorruptible. It's unperishable. It's undefiled on every level. It's an inheritance that's real, but it's also an inheritance that is guaranteed. It's already been promised by God. It says it is reserved in heaven for you who are kept through the power of God through faith, ready to be revealed in the last time. Two verses here, verse 4 and 5. In verse 4 it says, our inheritance is being kept for us. That way nobody here can mess with it, amen. My tax lawyer can't mess with it. My accountant can't steal it from me. My banker can't close it out on me, all right. My wife can't steal it. My kids can't take it, all right. Nobody can shoot me dead and steal it because it's not here. It's reserved and is an inheritance for me. But verse 5 says, for our inheritance is being kept. Verse 5 says, and we are being kept for our inheritance. Look at the grace and the beauty and the glory of God. He's keeping us so that we can get it. I I can't maintain this walk. I can't maintain this life. I can't maintain righteousness in my life. I fail. I stumble. I do stupid stuff. I make mistakes. I sin. I know that may be surprising to some of you, (laughs) but ask Kathy, she'll verify it. It's an inheritance that's guaranteed, but catch this. He says it's inherited that will be revealed at the last times. So we're being kept into salvation. Here's the way it works. We have been saved from the penalty of sin because of what Jesus has done for us. All right? We're not going to die and go to hell. We've also been saved in this life now. From the power of sin. In other words, I can live for Jesus. I have choices to make, though. There's discipline required. There's surrender to Christ and the Holy Spirit's power empowering my life. I need God in my life, and so I trust God daily. And as I trust God daily, then sin has less influence upon me. You understand that? You say, Brother Joe, I still sin. Well, why do I do that? Because you choose to or because you love it, all right? We still sin. 
So what we do is when we see the sins in our heart, we get it right with God and we confess because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can be made fresh and clean again. But what you understand, we've been saved from the power of sin, but also one day we'll be saved from the presence of sin. All right? It's going to come a time that you're going to close your eyes in death. All right, until, unless the Lord Jesus comes by, by glorious rapture and takes the church home. And, and if we die before that, listen, listen we're just, there's, there's no way you're going to escape that. The only way to escape death is the rapture. But here's the thing about it. You say, Brother Joe, what if I don't live long to the rapture? You're going to be all right. You're kept. When you close your eyes in death and open your eyes in the next millisecond, the Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. You're going to be kept. He says, so it's revealed in death. Obviously, it'll be revealed. The Bible, you know, John and Peter and Paul all over about the coming of the Lord. He says, we're going to see him one day. And when we see him, we'll be like him. What's he saying? You're going to, you're going to explode into the glory of God, into the presence of God, into a, to an understanding and a clarity that you're, of what your inheritance really is in God in Christ Jesus. Now, it will be fully revealed to all of creation in all of generations past, when all humanity stands at the throne room of God and we're all given account of our life and we all have to see that we either gave our hearts and life to Christ or we didn't give our hearts to life to Christ. And the judgment seat really is all about this, bottom line. It will once and for all make clear and prove without any doubt whatsoever that man cannot save himself. That no matter what our works are, no matter what our religious ties were, no matter what our efforts were. It's hopeless, it's frustrating, and it's futile. We need God. And it will be seen that salvation is based solely upon and completely on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God and the mercy of God. But let me say another thing about this hope. He says it's going to keep us going through every trial. Catch this verse. In this, this hope, you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> grieved by what? Hard times, hard knocks, difficult days. And there are trials in the way for every human being lost or saved. This life since sin has entered into our world, it's not going to be easy, it's not designed to be easy, and it's not designed to be free from difficulty or suffering. There's too many people basing some kind of little false philosophy at times, you know, that they have this idea that life's not going to be hard or life's not going to be difficult. It could well be they listen to what I call that, the, listen carefully to what we call the, the happiness boys. The happiness boys put it like this. God loves you. God wants to bless you. God wants to turn your world upside down in, in the right way. And God wants to take all the bad stuff that happens to you and just put it away. And you can know joy and peace and no problems and no sickness. Because if you're a Christian, you shouldn't get sick. And if you're a Christian, you shouldn't do this. Because God doesn't have that in plan. Here's what God has for you. It's just blessing and life and prosperity and health. And on and on it goes. You know? And it usually ends with this. So be sure and write me a check. <laughs> because God's going to bless, bless you. I know some of you are poor. I know you can barely get by and you can't hardly buy groceries. But you need to take your grocery money, send it to me, and God's going to bless it a hundredfold. Y'all have heard that, right? These guys need to wake up. They need to read the New Testament. They need to see the struggles of the disciples. They need to see the life that they lived and the difficulty they lived and the crisis that they went to. Every Christian can easily be seduced by those false philosophy at times and wonder. Here's how we know we're, we, we've, been, we've embraced that false idea. We wonder, why is this happening to me? Life's hard. The devil's a liar. The devil seeks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's why we're having a difficult time. The world's in opposition to God. We're going against stream as believers. The rest of the world wants to go this way. We want to go that way. And even take that aside, we all have issues. We all have struggles. We all face financial collapse. We all have breakdowns. We all have people break their promises. We all have people act bad toward us, terribly to us at times. We too, all of us, will fret over kids or grandkids. We will all face health problems on some level. And mark this down, we'll all face death. But here... 
The Bible makes it clear there's just no exemptions. We ha- we're going to go through these things if need be at different times. It's just going to happen. That the genuineness, he says, here's the answer. Why is it going? Why are you going through this? That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found into praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen to me, dear folks. Listen carefully to what I have to say. All those difficulties, all those trials which seem so hard to bear, those major mountains we face at times, as well as those minor irritants that seem to get up under our skin, or the person that rubs us the wrong way, or the illness which seems to debilitate us and hinder us and rob us of strength, those losses, the things that sadden you, the things that madden you, all those are allowed by God as part of a, he says here, a refining process to make your faith more precious than gold. God's purifying your heart and your life through every difficulty and every trial. Ultimately, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ and John, he tells us, go, I'm going to go and I prepare a place for you. But guess what's happening in the midst of the preparation in heaven is the preparation here. God's fitting us and preparing us for glory. And all too often when the conflicts comes and the trials come and the difficulties come and the temptations come, we fold our tents and quit. And God said, I'm trying to do something that's glorious in your life. I'm working out the impurities that there's nothing that's spoiling and disappointing and ruining your life. Heaven is a prepared place, but it is for a prepared people. So whatever the disappointment might be in your heart and your life, you take comfort in this. God's getting me ready for glory. And if I can realize that and embrace that truth and understand that principle, it will make all those trials much easier to bear in life. But on the other hand, if all those trials and testings and issues I have to deal with just make me angrier and frustrate me and I become bitter then you are robbing yourself of the intended benefit that God wants to bring in your life. God designs things that not only in the future, but here and now, that will show his glory from your life. We understand that when we're glorified and we're made like Jesus in heaven, everybody's going to see Jesus in us. But right now, in the nasty here and now, everybody's supposed to see Jesus in us. Christ is to be manifest through our life. We don't need to be hiding things. And what happens when the frustrations come and they come and things look hopeless? What do we do? We start whining. Or we get our pout going, you know, get our pout on good. But when we get your pout on, you start short-circuiting the grace of God and the glory of God that God wants to manifest through your life to other people. Say, so what should I do then? Remember this, God's getting me ready for glory. Get your shout on and see what God does. Get your focus down. Back to Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the final little slice of steak I want to cut up for you. And no matter whether you like it rare, medium, rare, well done, or whatever, this is going to taste good. It's a hope centered in the person of Jesus Christ, your Savior. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than of gold that perishes, may be found to the praise and the honor and the glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What's he telling us here? The focus changes now. Because I see this mercy of God and I see this living hope, the answer then is to put my attention, to focus my passion, to focus my life in and upon and around the Lord Jesus Christ as my sovereign Lord and Savior, whom having not seen, I believe, in whom having not seen, I trust, and I love it, whom having not seen, you love. So what's the answer? You love God. Your focus is upon Jesus and loving Jesus. He's your Savior. He's your Deliverer. He's your Redeemer. He's your brother. 
He's your glory. He's your savior. He's your salvation. He's your courage. He's your hope. He's your victory. In all things, the focus becomes upon Jesus Christ. The bottom line is this. What does it mean to be a Christian? You're a person who loves Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're a person who's chosen to take a path that says, I'm going to love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my body, and all my strength. And down deep inside of you, when you resolutely commit to that love of God, there is a joy, he says, that springs forth that cannot be explained, and it cannot be stopped, it cannot be contained. It is not natural, it is not emotional, it is a spiritual resting peace of hope and glory in your life. It's a joy that's rooted in your relationship to Jesus Christ. And nothing, nothing that can happen to you can get you so far down into your life to destroy that which God has placed in your heart and in your soul. That's his very life and presence. The true believer ought to be the most joyous person that walks the earth. That does not mean I'm walking around, waving little banners all the time, singing hoopla songs. But it does mean that no matter what hell may throw at me, I have this deep abiding peace and hope and a comfort that brings satisfaction and grace and joy into my life because Christ is in my life and he loves me. He loves Joe Arms with an everlasting love. And if anything should put a smile on Joe Arms' face, it ought to be understanding that God loves me in spite of every foul thing I've ever done, in spite of every wrong thing I've ever done, in spite of every wrong word I've ever said, instead of every wrong path I've ever taken, God chose to love me in spite of all that. I ask you today, where's your hope? This world will easily destroy your hopes. But you keep your hope anchored In Christ, he will deliver. He will save. He cannot go against himself, nor his promise, nor his words. You make sure that what he's talking in this passage is that my hope is so secure that even in my trials, even in the worst of times, even though I don't see him, I love him and I believe him. That's where he talks about the genuineness of your faith. Genuine, how do, where does that come from? I know he lives. What's the old Easter song we sang years ago? He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within My heart, that is a hope that the world cannot steal. I'd ask you to stand with your heads bowed for a moment. Believers Fellowship, we always close our services, what we call an invitation. It's a time where we allow God.